Greetings everyone. I'm Dr. Ankia Kutsia from Cape Town, South Africa, and I will be discussing prevention of prediabetes with the newer agents. The burden of type 2 diabetes have increased rapidly over the past few decades, and obesity and prediabetes as well as diabetes have established themselves as one of the greatest public health challenges of our time. A number of complications have historically been associated with diabetes, and this includes both micro and macrovascular disease. And as you know, heart failure has also emerged as a significant contributor to morbidity and mortality in people with type 2 diabetes. Now, despite the tremendous effort and advances put into prolonging the lives of people living with diabetes, it unfortunately remains the fifth leading cause of death globally. Studies have indicated that an estimate of life lost to diabetes around the time of midlife is between 5 to 10 years, so that's up to a decade. So over and above these traditional micro and macrovascular complications, there are a significant number of additional complications that are currently noted in the context of people having diabetes. So this is not limited to, but really includes things like cognitive and functional disabilities, neuropsychiatric abnormalities such as depression, things like metabolic associated liver disease and lastly but certainly not the least infections and cancer. So in light of the impact of diabetes globally prevention has been made a priority. It's also important to note that at the diagnosis of diabetes is not the point where the risk starts to increase. So in fact, glucose exposure, even at levels lower than that of overt diabetes, has been shown to clearly contribute risk. So it's in essence an exposure or an area under the glucose curve over time. This slide depicts the prevalent micro and macrovascular complications that's associated with longer exposure to hyperglycemia. And from these bars, one can appreciate that the risk is greater with a longer duration of exposure, even in the setting of lower abnormal glucose values, such as in the pre-diabetes category that is depicted in the green bars. And one can clearly appreciate how it's higher compared to people who were tested and found to be normoglycemic in the past, and these people are represented by the blue bars. So while there's been significant debate about the screening, the cutoffs, and the nomenclature of prediabetes, it remains noteworthy that prediabetes and the company it keeps are associated with a much higher atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk as well as microvascular complication risk. Now, since obesity and prediabetes are the main precursors of diabetes, the pathophysiology of these conditions is relatable. It, however, does remain quite complex and we don't know exactly at what point the risk starts or the inception point is. Now, to address weight, lifestyle measures are really well established to reduce diabetes risk. But the amount of weight that one can lose and the need to continue and adhere to these lifestyle measures, unfortunately, in the real life, impacts on the sustainability thereof. The good news, however, is that obesity is recently becoming a modifiable risk factor with the amount of weight loss achievable that can contribute meaningfully to risk in the clinical setting. In the pathway to cardiovascular disease, the onset and worsening of obesity not only increases insulin resistance, but places more stress on the beta cell, facilitating eventual beta cell failure and the progression to sustained hyperglycemia, which ultimately becomes diabetes. Now, when we aim to improve glycemia through weight loss, we ultimately also address other cardiovascular risk factors that really illustrates the impact overweight has on the blood pressure, cholesterol, and so forth. Now, the minimum clinically relevant weight loss required is 5%, but from most more recent studies, such as the Luke Ed study, we know that the biggest bang for our buck is most likely in the region of 10% minimum. 
So in the light of the recent progress we've made with regard to the understanding of the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes and the contributors to hyperglycemia, it makes sense that treatment targets that really aim to address the relevant mechanisms in each person and potentially multiple mechanisms such as feeding circuits, gut health and energy expenditure might be more effective than targeting one single mechanism only. The recent landmark cardiovascular outcome trials has neatly demonstrated the weight loss potential of the GLP-1 receptor agonists, as you can see in the bar graphs, and the degree of weight loss or the weight loss potential of these drugs by far outweigh the abilities of lifestyle or some of the older agents used in the management of obesity. In the SCALE randomized controlled trial, it's been shown that that liraglutide, 3 milligrams, achieves weight loss of more than 5% and almost two-thirds and more than 10% in a third of people with prediabetes at 56 weeks. The same trend is seen in people living with diabetes. So when considering some of the newer GLP-1 receptor agonists, such as semaglutide that was tested in the STEP trials or the STEP program, one can appreciate that more than half of the participants with prediabetes achieved a 15 or more percent of weight loss, as opposed to a 4.9 percent in the placebo arm. It has consequently been shown to decrease the risk of diabetes by 60%. And it is also shown that 80% of individuals with prediabetes in the semi-group reverted to normal glycemia, and this is compared to 35% in the placebo arm. So evidence is accumulating that the weight loss potential of the twin cretins or the molecules in combination, so that's a GLP-1 receptor agonist and the GIP molecule, achieve weight loss in the ranges traditionally associated with metabolic surgery. So these twin cretins are really introducing a new era in terms of medical weight loss or non-surgical weight loss. This amount one trial assessed uh, the effect of these twin cretins or tazepatide on the 10 year risk of developing type 2 diabetes in people with overweight or obesity. And a post hoc analysis subsequently compared people with and without prediabetes. Now, the mean risk reduction in people with prediabetes at 72 weeks for tazepatide, 5, 10, and 15 milligrams were greater in individuals with prediabetes, and the baseline 10 year diabetes risk were around 30% at baseline. The mean reduction in 10 year risk in the prediabetes group for the dosages 15, 10, and 5 milligram, as depicted in the forest plot, were 18, 17, and 13 percent, respectively compared to an 11 to 12 percent in individuals without prediabetes. So this amount, one study subsequently concluded that tazepatide is effective in reducing the predicted risk of developing type 2 diabetes compared to placebo, and it does that through achieving significant weight loss that was dose dependent. And it appeared as if the people that have benefited most with regards to diabetes prevention were individuals who had prediabetes at baseline. So taken together, most of the studies indicate that GLP-1 receptor agonists or the combination of GLP-1 receptor agonists and GIP, the twin cretins, are effective in the prevention of type 2 diabetes through weight loss. Now, with prediabetes and obesity contributing to not only the cardiovascular burden, but also to emerging risks such as cancer, mental health abnormalities, and so forth, it is important to consider the prevention early on in the course of the disease, and should lifestyle measures not be adequate enough to prevent these conditions, one should or potentially could revert and assist patients with pharmacological means in order to reduce their risk. So while these pharmacological agents are excellent and the results from studies really indicate the efficacy in the prevention of diabetes by addressing weight, 
it's crucial to note that it's very unlikely that we will be able to impact on the global burden of disease with regards to non-communicable diseases by pharmacological means. And it re therefore remains essential that we address obesogenic environments, um, address the environment specifically thinking about things like endocrine disrupting chemicals, decreasing access to unhealthy foods and allowing safe spaces where people can exercise and not from the viewpoint only of preventing diabetes, but really allowing individuals an environment in which they can thrive metabolically. So ending on a high note with the words of Benjamin Franklin that has really stood the test of time. Remember that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Goodbye.